Okay, those of you who are here probably already know who I am, just in case. Michael Chittister, pretty good crowd today. That was a joke. But the few with the dedicated. My voice is already starting to go from refereeing, but whatever. I run a little project called Wicked Hour that I hope you all have heard of. Today, we're going to talk about the art of fencing of Johannes Lichtenauer. And we're going to pay special attention to an often underrated guy named Hans Mädel von Salzburg. So, what's it going to look like? Do a quick introduction, make a few distinctions. Talk about Lichtenauer and the Zedl, or recital. Talk about the Fellowship of Lichtenauer, who those guys were, what their deal is. Review briefly the idea of glosses and illustrations and what they teach us, and then go into Hans Mädel, our most beloved master of the Lichtenauer tradition. <clears throat> so, I feel like I should always apologize in advance for the fact that I don't actually know German really at all, and so some of my pronunciation may be a bit painful to hear if you're better at German than I am. Tough. You came to me, I didn't come to you. So, I'll, I'll do the best I can, bear with me. To begin with, everybody here should know what a Fechtbuch is. Fechtbuch is the plural, plural of that. They are treatises that teach us about fencing. Sometimes they look like that. This is the copy of Gladiatoria that's at New Haven, Connecticut, um, in the Yale Center for British Art. It's a very pretty book. Just as often, however, they're like this, not quite so pretty, not quite so helpful. This is the manuscript 3227A. So, this is the famous Dobringer manuscript, even though it was mostly not written by a dude named Dobringer. So, to talk about fencing manuals and give an idea of what they are, we're gonna turn to the greatest master of all time, Fiore Friulano de Liberi, who was a 14th, 15th century fencing master in the border region between Italy and Germany, modern day Italy and modern day Germany, also known as the edge of the Holy Roman Empire. He authored a fencing manual in about 1409, which is really one of the best organized, most helpful fencing manuals of the period, regardless of what you think of his actual teachings. First of all, so we're going to treat this as our ideal fencing manual, and the main thrust of today's lecture is going to be how we can get there with Lichtenauer texts, how we do and what that looks like. Fiore's fencing manual comes in four different versions that we have today. As you can see, I really wish this projector was better. They are all rather different. This is the same place from four different versions. But you can see right away, they have A, pictures, they have text, they have actually quite a lot of text and different text between the versions. The two on the right here have short little explanations, the two on the left have long paragraphs. There's also, and I realize it's less obvious in this particular view, a nice organization scheme where he uses golden markers to tell you what's happening in these plays. Golden crowns indicate a basic technique. Golden garters indicate variations on it, and the person wearing the garter is the one who's winning in each match. And a crown with a garter indicates a counter to one of those variations. It's very nice. And actually, in this one, the second one from the left, the silver sword is an extra indicator of who's winning in an exchange. And when they both have silver swords, it's an equal engagement where either one could win. So it's a, actually a pretty clever organization scheme. To delve in a bit further, you begin with a guard. You show how the guard actually can defend you, which is called the remedy to an attack. Then you show various scholars or students of the, who show you how to use the guard to do different techniques. And then you end up with a contrary, which means counter, <coughs> and sometimes counters to those counters. Nice, organized, concise, easy to follow. That is not how Lichtenauer is at all. However, with a little bit of work and a little bit of research, we can get close to it. So I'm going to explain how that works. 
However, this is not how most HEMA research has been done in the past. Most interpretations that are used today are, we came from combining Talhofer and Meyer. We're not going to talk about that, though, because we can do better. The tradition begins with this dude, Johannes Lichtenauer. Johannes Lichtenauer was probably a 14th or 15th century fencing master, not unlike Fiore. The only testament of his life, the only biographical information at all that we have comes from one manuscript, which is the Nuremberg House Book, or Manuscript 3227A, which has one short paragraph of description of him, and says, and before other things, you should notice and know that there is only one art of the sword, and it was invented and put together many hundreds of years before, and it is a basis and a core of all the arts of fighting. Master Lichtenauer learned and mastered this art in a thorough and rightful way, but he did not invent the art. As I stated before, instead, he traveled and searched many countries with the will of learning and mastering this rightful and true art. There it is. That is everything that can be known about Lichtenauer. It's entirely possible that he never existed in the first place. However, there are quite a lot of fencing masters later on who claim to teach his art. <clears throat> so, he left behind, assuming he existed, a poem, which we call the Dezedel, which really just means list in German, or we, we translate it usually as recital, because that kind of sounds like Zedel. And it is apparently a recording of an oral tradition that existed for quite a while before he ever wrote it down. It is a, <clears throat> I have a note here because I always forget this, 356 line poem, 179 rhyming couplets. It's not great poetry. It's very much designed to be catchy and easy to remember. It's not high art. Of those, 109 of those couplets are about the long sword, 29 are about the short sword, and 40 are about fencing on horseback. The, it's very often, sorry, that's not what this slide is about. <clears throat> the oldest version that we have that has Lichtenauer's name on it is this one from Hans Talhofer in 1443. The oldest one that we have that doesn't have Lichtenauer's name on it is this manuscript, which has that series of numbers and letters on the title bar there by a guy named H. Berenger in probably the 1420s. So a bit earlier. We don't know who that guy is e er, e either, if he was a student of Lichtenauer, if he was a teacher of Lichtenauer, if he had nothing to do with Lichtenauer. We don't know. But that raises a few eyebrows as far as who actually originated this poem, where it came from. There are also various other statements that exist. This one from the 1460s is in a manuscript in Wolfenbüttel, which is written in Low German, as opposed to the High German of the core text, and has a lot of variant verses, well, several, that aren't in the main text. Doesn't mention Lichtenauer. This one by Hans Lekuchner in the 1470s into the, well, up until he died, 1482, he was writing, um, which has a verse very similar to Lichtenauer's, except that it combines Lichtenauer's uh, armored and unarmored verses together and creates a new teaching out of them for the Messer. He doesn't ever mention Lichtenauer's name. He just says that he is referencing an older master. And there is Peter Faulkner, who was a captain of the Marx Bruder in the 1490s, three-time captain of the Marx Bruder, which was kind of a big deal. Not many guys got elected three times. Wrote a, wrote a fencing manuscript in the 1495-ish which also has a statement of the verse that's very different from Lichtenauer's. It's about 60% the same. And all of Lichtenauer's verse as a separate teaching. The, the, point of the, what, the reason why I show these is just to point out that it's not quite as simple or clear cut as we've got a poem, Lichtenauer wrote it, end of story. There's a lot of questions we haven't answered yet. And the final distinction I want to make before we dive into this is long sword versus short sword. I'm going to talk about a lot of today about Lichtenauer's Art of the Long Sword. I am not talking about a sword, because when Lichtenauer says long sword, he is not talking about a sword. He has two teachings, which are labeled Lichtenauer's Art of the Long Sword, Lichtenauer's Art of the Short Sword. In this case, long means you're extending the sword with both hands on one end. Short means you are withdrawing the sword 
with, with one hand at either end. That's all. All of the German teachings talk about swords. The only time longsword appears is when Lichtenauer says, here's how you fight with the sword extended. The idea that there's a sword called a longsword is a modern idea that we made up. Well, at least that's what the longsword is. Throughout history, any sword that was unusually long would be called a longsword. If it was a rapier, if it was a Viking sword, it didn't matter. Anyways, let's quickly review the armored stuff, cover kind of judicial dueling. Starts with mounted stuff, spear on horseback, sword, grappling on horseback, mounted versus dismounted with sword and spear. Then you go to the ground. Sword, again, in the short sword guards. Different kinds of fencing. Grappling, ground fighting with daggers. Then, you know, you shank a motherfucker and you steal his clothes and put him in a body bag and you kneel and you thank Jesus um, as Hans Talhofer looks on proudly. But that's all fine. There's, there are a lot of interesting teachings about that, but nobody in HEMA cares about that stuff because none of us have horses or armor. Well, except Bill Frisbee. So, okay, this is a bit of a joke. We do care about this, but it's really hard to study unless you have the equipment, and the equipment is hella expensive. So, primarily what we study in HEMA is, of course, the longsword teachings. And those are organized into 17 Hauptstücke, which means chief techniques. And this is how they're introduced in Lichtenauer's verse. This is the text of the place of the recital, or tzedel. Wrath cud crooked, thwart, has squinter with parter, fool parries, following after, etc., etc. Pretty clear, right? That's all you have to do. Then it goes on and gives you all this helpful instruction. Whoever cuts over you, the wrath cut point threatens him. If he becomes aware of it, t t um, so take away above without driving. Be strong against and thrust. If he sees it, take it down and so on and so forth. These are what the later writers refer to as Lichtenauer's obscure and cryptic words. As you can see, they are not overstating that. If this is the only survival of Lichtenauer's teachings, we would not be studying Lichtenauer today. This is not enough to actually reconstruct a fencing style. We would all be furists. However, and fortunately, a lot of other masters came after Lichtenauer and gave us more than this. Primarily, a group of 16 dudes who Paulus Kahl labels the Fellowship of Lichtenauer, which is the Gesellschaft Lichtenauers. <clears throat> Unfortunately, of these 16 guys, or 17 if you count Lichtenauer himself, only six of them actually left writings behind. And again, that includes Lichtenauer. Peter von Danzig, Zum Ingolstadt, Andre Lignitzer, Sigmund Ringek, Martin Hunfeldt, and Ott Yud, all of whom you may have heard of because those texts are very widely studied in our, in our community. The rest of these guys, we have no idea. I mean, Dietrich, the dagger fighter of Braunschweig, was probably a knife guy, but it's really hard to say much about what their teachings were because they haven't survived if they were ever written down in the first place. <clears throat> what we know from their names is that, and from a few biographical details for those six guys, is that they came from a pretty wide swath of, West, of Eastern Europe into Eastern Germany. A lot of guys from modern day Poland, Czech Republic, Austria, and Eastern Germany. All over the map, really, if the map is zoomed in exactly this far. <laughs> and I'm gonna very quickly review sort of a timeline of how these guys appear in history so you can see a few interesting things about it. The oldest manuscript we, we often say is this one, which I already showed you, 3227A. Unfortunately, the date people give of 1389 is probably wrong. It's based on this calendar, which is on 83 Werso um, of the manuscript, which is a 105 year calendar that gives the date of, I wanna say Pentecost, every year for 105 years from 1390 to 1495. And 40 years ago, someone looked at that and said, hey, 1390, this must have been written in 1389. And that's the foundation of everybody's theories about when Lichtenauer lived. However, I'm gonna highlight the other date, which is 1495, and point out that on the inside cover, 
Nicholas Pohl signed it in 1494. So that's basically the time period when we can say this came from that century. Beyond that, we really have no idea. If we ignore this book, here's what the timeline of Lichtenauer looks like. 1443, Talhofer records that Zedel. Otjud seems to still be alive. He doesn't describe him as being dead at least, which all later writers do. <clears throat> 1452, the manuscript that we call Codex Danzig was written. Andre Lignitzer, Martin Hunsfeld, and Otjud now are labeled as dead. Peter von Danzig himself seems to still be alive. 1450s, Codex Lou, same texts, same blessing on the dead. Ringek's patron, the Albrecht, the Duke Albrecht that he probably served, reigned from 1438 to, 14, to 1460, and that's Albrecht III. There were actually four different um, Dukes Albrecht in Bavaria in this 100-year period, but whatever. This guy seems most likely. 1470, Paulus Cal finally records the list of the Gesellschaft of Lichtenauers. I have some slides here, and I forget why I have these here. All right, so I guess we're going to go back to this list for a second. Now I've got some names highlighted in blue. Oh, I remember. So if we ask ourselves who these guys were, again, here are the guys who wrote fencing manuals that we still have, <clears throat> including Paulus Cal himself, who wrote the list. The names in blue cover armored fencing. And now I'm including Hans Pegnitzer because Joachim Meyer, in his 1571 manuscript, um, which is in Rostock, includes a play of armored polax, which he says was Hans Pegnitzer's technique. So we can sort of assume that whatever he wrote down, if there was ever a writing, included armored polax, so he makes the list. The other guys we have treatises from, they all cover armor. So nearly everyone in this group that we can prove anything about was interested in armored fencing. And the question is, oh, and Hanstetner von Mornschein, who we don't have any writings from, if the, we found the right guy in history, was also a military man. And he trained Paulus Cal. So the question is, if we look at this timeline, there's something pretty interesting, which is, right before it starts, there was a major war in Eastern Europe that sucked in mercenaries and knights from all over the continent to go fight the Hussite heretics um, in Bohemia, which we call the Hussite Crusades. And those ran from 1419 to 1434. Not only was everyone, everyone who could fight going there in that time period, but they were actually organizing themselves into fellowships, or Gesellschaften, which were covenants they would swear to each other to go off and form a company and protect each other and fight this war. It was the way that military, the militaries were organized in this time. If you were an independent company, you would organize a fellowship and travel together. Was Lichtenauer's fellowship one of these? I mean, there's no way to be sure about it. But if you have 16 guys who liked armored fencing and needed a job in the 1420s and 30s, that was the place to go. There were also other wars happening that were smaller, but still significant in the same time period. This seems like the most obvious one. And then 1430s, 1440s, you come back from the war because now that we're no longer fighting the heretics and need jobs. And then, what do you know? Suddenly, all these fencing manuals begin appearing. <clears throat> it's possible. Back to these guys. They wrote a whole bunch of texts, or at least the texts they wrote appear in a whole bunch of different books. In, four, in 1985, um, Hans Peter Hills made this diagram of how all the ones he knew about interconnected. But he only knew about 55 German fencing manuals. Currently. My index has about 110 German fencing manuals. And if we just take the Lichtenauer glosses, which we'll come to in a minute, my diagram looks more like this. I know, it's not the clearest thing in the world. However, if we boil it down, we find out that there are only six glosses of Lichtenauer's teachings. What is a gloss? A gloss is an attempt to define terms. A glossary, basically, is, where the, is what this eventually turns into in our sort of literary tradition. In this period, it was very common for things like the Bible to take the form of glosses, where you would have a verse, or especially just the parts that were written, by Je or that were written about Jesus, and you'd take each piece and you'd write big, long explanations of each verse. Often in the margins, sometimes you have these crazy books 
with this tiny piece of text in the middle and then all these glosses written around it? In this case, the people are not glossing the words of Jesus, they're glossing the words of Johannes Lichtenauer. And very often, each individual couplet will get its own explan explanatory paragraphs. And as many texts as we have right now, they all boil down to one of these six things. Well, I mean, kind of seven, but I'll tell you in a few minutes why that one doesn't count. So, really in this complex web, all we care about are these six circles, which means we can simplify it down to this. Essentially, there are two glosses that stand alone, and then a whole bunch that seem to have branched off of some primordial source that we don't have anymore. And I will try to very quickly tell you what each one is. This is the part where everyone falls asleep, so I'm going to bust through it as fast as I can. There is Peter von Denzig, who wrote a gloss only on the um, armored fencing on foot, right? The short sword, which, as I already said, nobody cares about, so we'll move on. The reason why he's significant is because for a long time, everybody foolishly assumed that he also wrote a much longer gloss that covered all three sections, which is why we now refer to that author, who we don't know who he was, as pseudo Peter von Danzig, which means the guy that we used to think was Peter von Danzig, but now we know isn't. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen this picture before. It's been, being, it's been passed around Hema since before the internet. If you ever wondered why you've only seen this picture and not anything else from this book, it's because this book only has two illustrated pages, and there they are. Oh, and that picture of Lichtenauer I showed you earlier. There's no other pictures in this book. However, this one is so famous. <clears throat> and the gloss that it comes from, we think of as our primary gloss. People who study Lichtenauer and only study one source usually study this gloss. Um, however, asterisk, it actually comes in two different versions. And again, people who study Lichtenauer only study the one on the right. The one on the left was only first translated by Corey Winslow last year. Before that, it had never been, never been available in English. The one on the right was translated several times and has been published a few times and has been around for a while. Which is unfortunate because that one that no one studies is by far the more common one. It was copied a lot more. There are two primary versions from the 1400s that have some differences. It was the one that uh, Paulus Hector Meyer included in his giant books and translated to Latin, which is a pretty interesting book, actually, because it gives you insights into what he thought all these words meant, as opposed to what we think they mean, right or wrong. Um, and again, now we can finally study it. It's on Wicked Hour, but that's a fairly recent phenomenon. Before that, it was only this one, which only exists in four, ver in four copies, as opposed to the 13 of the other one. However, they are all illustrated. There's that one I just showed you with only two pictures. There's Goliath, which is extensively illustrated um, and shows all kinds of techniques <clears throat> and actually illustrates all three versions, although the short sword was never actually finished. So the last several sketches are pretty rough like that. And was even copied partially by Leonard Zollinger in the 16th century although he only copied down the grappling plays for some reason. So he has these six pages with these illustrations like that and no explanation for how they got there because as far as we know, he never actually had this book. Um, Leinhard Zollinger, by the way, I guess I should say, was the, man the fencing manual dealer who sold a whole bunch of shit to Paulus Hector Meyer and also seems to have acquired basically every known copy of Jörg Wilhelm Hooter's uh, fencing manuals and sold most of them to Meyer and sold a few others to other people. So some kind of word connection there. And he was also a fry factor of some note in the mid 16th century. And there are outliers. One of them is in Vienna, which is an interesting intermediate copy. And one of them is in, Aug is in Augsburg by a guy named Antonius Rast, who was another captain of the Marx Bruder, died in 14, 1549. Paulus Hector Meyer bought his papers and produced this fencing manual from them, but it's a horrible, horrible rend rendering of the gloss 
because it jumps around and like has fragments of so many different things. It just kind of goes back and forth between the two versions with no recognizable pattern. And then at the end, for some reason, switches to Ringek and has like 14 paragraphs of Ringek instead to finish off. I don't know how he managed to build this thing, but he did. So there you go, there's that. Speaking of Ringek, there's a ton of copies of Ringek stuff, but they're all incomplete, which is kind of unfortunate. We don't know if Ringex is a variation or an original text. I like to, to fantasize that Ringex actually authored the primary gloss as well, and it just lost his name at some point. And this is a uh, sort of corrupted copy of his original gloss, meaning Ringex was pseudo Peter von Danzig, but we have no idea. He may have just been a guy who copied it down and taught from it. There's only one version of Ringek that anyone ever studies. It's this one, the Dresden version. If you look at these scans, this is a terrible manuscript. I mean, there's parts scribbled out. It's messy. It's very incomplete. There are places where the scribe missed keywords when he was copying down. Like, you know, oh, this sentence has no verb. And the verb was going to tell us what was happening. Shit. Um, there's, it also stops in the middle of Ringek's mounted gloss and doesn't give us the other half which meant that because no one ever studies anything but this, until recently, everyone said, oh, Ringek never finished his mounted gloss. He did. We've got a copy of it. It's just not in here. <clears throat> also, Ringek's original gloss appears to have been illustrated because the two other most complete versions endlessly say, you know, refer to the illustration. Do this as is illustrated below or as was just illustrated. And the Dresden version, the scribe tried to remove all of those things. And we know he did that because he missed a few. So there's one place in there that has the complete phrase, as is shown in the illustration. And it's funny to see how translators tried to deal with that, knowing that there were no illustrations. But now we can see it's in the exact place that it's supposed to be in these texts. And then other places, they cut out part of the sentence, but not the whole thing. It's really a mess. The one on the right. The Rostock one is by, was owned by Joachim Meyer, and it includes the text but not the illustrations, even though it refers to the illustrations. Albrecht Dürer, this guy, who's best known for this fencing manual, included about 50 pages of text at the back of this fencing manual, but only the pictures have ever actually been published. So uh, Daniel Jacquet has the text, it's been transcribed, it includes part of Ringek and backs up some of these things that are missing from Dresden. And there are various other fragments here and there that exist. Part of it was copied into Andre Parnfein's published book in 1516 and then passed on to other books from there. Hans Madel, who we'll get to in a second, included Ring stuff from Ringek. The Salzburg version of the anonymous gloss includes nine paragraphs of Ringek that are just kind of inserted here and there even though it was written before any known copy of Ringek. We don't know what the deal is. It's a really fascinating text. It's really hard to put it together into what it might have originally looked like. <clears throat> Almost done, guys. This is the boring part, like I said. 3227A, we've already talked about. This is a very troubling work because we don't know who wrote it and we don't know what they knew. It disagrees with a lot of texts in our text as far as its teachings go. It was either written by a very advanced master who had a very deep understanding of the art or by a raw novice who didn't really know much at all. But like to, so it was either written by a really impressive master or the, mid, or the early modern equivalent of a Facebook troll who was just like postulating his own garbage and demanding that everyone believe it. It is, as is becoming a theme, incomplete. Only about half the verses have glosses. A lot of the instructions are very basic. It is, for example, the only text that tells you how to hold a sword. It's also the only text that gives you ideas like Vorschlag and Nachschlag. And it has a lot of common fencing type teachings nested among the Lichtenauer teachings. Yo. Is that the, the blank space on that page? Um, when there are verses that aren't glossed, is that what it looks like? As if somebody yeah. left room yeah. for... Uh... That at the top is the verse. 
and there's just blank space, no gloss. When there's a gloss, it looks more like this. The verse at the top, and then a whole bunch of explanation. But very incomplete. <clears throat> so it has all the basics that you would expect a beginner to, to learn from his teacher. It has a lot of philosophical uh, meanderings that are based on Aristotelian and Platonic philosophy, good classic medieval stuff. The person who wrote it was very well educated, whoever, whatever else he was. It doesn't have a lot of the teachings that we would expect the our text to have, and it doesn't even have commentary on a lot of Lichtenauer's um, verses. <clears throat> and that brings us to Hans Madel von Salzburg. Hans Madel was a fencing master, obviously, in, in Salzburg in the early 1500s. We, can, we have record of him. And I believe he actually worked in Marburg for a while, too, but I don't seem to have any notes here. So it's in the Wichtenauer article. Um, from 1501, he's attested as being a fencing master. 1539, this manuscript was written, or at least that's the date that Pelos Hector Meyer wrote at the top of it, because he eventually bought this text. And, well, actually, the uh, caption he puts on it indicates that it was stolen, so he may have just bought it from a fence. I mean, who knows where it came from. He had it, though. It was in his library. We think of this as the metagloss, because it's the only text that actually offers commentary on other glosses. <clears throat> and I'm going to come back to this theme at the very end, because the last part of this lecture is about Hans Mädel. So we'll skip past that for now. But remember this guy. It's an important text for a lot of reasons. It's illustrated but only has 17 illustrations, and they don't always appear to actually match up to the text of the page. It may have just been an artist decided to draw some interesting filler. And it is, once again, incomplete. This is the last page. It ends with von dem Zuken and finish. On to the next section, nothing else. <clears throat> if it was ever complete, we don't have those pages. Hopefully, they exist somewhere. And very quickly, Hans Lekuchner, I'm sure you've all have heard of, Messer Master. He has a lot of interesting stuff. He has a book with over 400 illustrations. It covers normal, you know, classic fencing, binding and stuff, grappling, disarms, and then a lot of ridiculous stuff like throwing guys in sacks and, and playing games and so on. There's a lot of techniques that appear to be designed for tournament play um, and not for actual serious encounters. We don't know who he was, if he was, actually, if he was a show master who was just teaching people how to be flashy, or if he was a legitimate fencing master, or both. Could be both. But the book is a bit problematic. It also is based in large part on the same anonymous gloss again, which he copied and expanded, even though he never gives credit to anyone. So, oops. We might think of this as a Lickmeister gloss, per the introduction to 3227A. The false masters who teach show fighting and not proper fencing according to Lichtenauer. There's an argument there. I don't know. But it is, in some ways, the seventh gloss. <clears throat> now, I showed you before, we have our 17 Hauptstück. When we add in the learnings from these glosses, this impenetrable list of things becomes an actual coherent curriculum with five hidden strikes and 12 chief techniques, each of which actually has a lot of teachings attached to it. These break down into a structured pedagogy, beginning with general advice, moving through structured set plays built around five strikes, discussing a tactical framework of four wards, four ways to break those wards, and how to chase people who are but essentially, how to attack people based on whether they are too stationary or too active. Oops. <clears throat> and then moving through a glossary of other techniques that are covered and explained in the five strikes, which then gives you more background and more context for them. And finish with a summary where it indicates that all offensing can be described as 24 windings. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean... I can't describe all fencing that way, but I'm not a master. So who knows? Interesting in all of this is what is not explained in these teachings. 
For example, he never actually explains things that are considered fundamental today, like footwork. He doesn't explain structure. He doesn't explain, he doesn't ever actually tell you to assume any guards. Instead, he gives advice like, hold the sword near your right shoulder, and doesn't seem to care what you do. I made this little comic at some point about this. Probably because he expects his students to already have a good foundation in fencing. So when he tells you, hold your sword up high by your shoulder, you know, a guard. You've already learned a way to stand. Unless it's wrong, then he's not going to fix you. He tells you to step with your right foot. He doesn't care how you're stepping as long as you're stepping with your right foot. <clears throat> At the beginning, he, he has certain specific behaviors he corrects, like cutting against your lead leg, like striking from your weak side, but most behaviors he doesn't even address. And I think that's intentional because Lichtenauer wants you to fence the way you're comfortable fencing unless it's actually a stupidly, a stupid, a martially stupid action. But if you're already a young knight and not a squire or any other student, then you probably know a way to move that isn't stupid. <clears throat> the structured set plays are actually not about the five strikes, despite endless arguments on email lists and then on forums and message boards and now on Facebook about how these strikes are done. They are the least important part of Lichtenauer's art. Nearly everything that's recorded is assuming that these strikes failed, or at least that they were an opening action and not a finishing one. Instead, he says, do the Zornhau, and then gives you a whole branching tree of what to do once you have a long edge on long edge bind. He doesn't ever say, do a Zornhau, and then he dies. That's not how this works. The crooked or arcing cut is a long edge cut to the inside opening and teaches you how to bind on or with the flat, depending on what text you read. The thwarting or crossing hue, the tverhau, short edge outside opening, the squinting hue, short edge inside opening, and the scalp or vertex hue, long edge to the top of the head, which is not an opening, but you know, it's a good place to hit a guy. And each one of these has teachings that are about the binds that arise, not about the cut itself, right? Binding with the long edge, binding on the flat, binding with the short edge, binding against short positions, and binding against hanging covers. And then we have tactical framework for sieges, for, for fences, also for onsetsins or offenses, which don't get their own building, but are treated as something as a separate concept, and the Nachreisen, blah, blah, blah. What this means is we can take these obscure and hidden words that are, help, that are worthless by themselves and suddenly get a whole bunch of explanation of what they mean. Yeah. I highlighted a bunch of stuff here. I'm going to move on. You guys know how Zornhau works. The point is, each one of these different glosses gives us different details. What was that? Do we? I mean, you better. So it tells you things like strike to the head. Or no, when he strikes to the head, then you do a Zornhau. It breaks all upper hues with the point. Nothing other than a simple peasant strike. And so on. No strike is more ready to a man in his rage. It ends with an onsetzen, right? So that's him on, so that's him upon him, which I just mentioned, and so on. But the point is, they all give us different information that we can put together into a more comprehensive description. Um, I've got some notes on pictures. They're not important. Pictures are cool. And if we take pictures, we can apply them to these same explanations and get a better idea of how these techniques work. So he strikes to your head, cut wrathfully at the same time onto his sword, and then starts him in the face or the chest. <clears throat> and we have pictures of all kinds of shit. Um, don't care about that anymore. Hans Madel. All right, we're at 4 o'clock, guys, and this is scheduled to end at 4.30, so... I'm going to try and bust through the rest of this quickly and either give people time to ask questions or time to leave early. Hans Madel von Salzburg is often discounted by people as being merely a copy of Ringek. And this is mostly because in his preface, he totally copies Ringek, although he calls him Master Sigmund Sheening. But otherwise, it's all word for word Ringek's preface up until the end, where he says, and thereafter also enriched and improved by other masters, and especially through Master Hans Madel from Salzburg. 
This is because he is the only, only Lichtenauer master to quote other glosses in his text, both Ringek and the anonymous gloss. Here's an example of something he copies from Ringek. The so it's the uh, texting gloss of a play against the Pesetzen. Here's the English. Not that important. The important thing is, if we look at, we put the text side by side, Hans Madel, word for word the same. Oh, except he adds a whole second paragraph of stuff on top of Ringek's teachings, <clears throat> which gives you additional follows, follow-ons from this technique. And I'm not going to read it because I hate people who read their whole slides. I can give you guys this slide deck later if you really want to see all of it. He also copies the pseudo von Danzig text, especially with, mostly from the Yud Lev copy. Um, here's the traveling after. If you put them side by side, they're, except for the initial clause, which is in italics, it's the same damn text, including the second paragraph. So remember these guys, Fellowship of Lichtenauer? I told you there were only six known texts from these guys. That was true, except Hans Madel apparently had access to another guy who we don't have teachings from, Hans Seidenfaden von Erfurt. He mentions him several times in his text, including giving several teachings from Hans Madel, or Hans Seidenfaden. So here is a Lichtenauer master who we don't know any teachings from except for the ones that he knew, apparently. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, well, so they're mostly in the section of the Scheidelhau, um, where he says, okay, Han, Master Hans Seden Faden taught the scalper thusly, striking him straight from the top of the head at the long edge, and swiftly upon that, an undercut to the right side of his head. Interesting. Not how I did the Scheidelhau, but apparently it's how he did in the 1400s. Thereafter, according to the two plays in his school, Rules of Other Strikes, when you cannon about with the scalper, if he then parries high with the sword gripped with the armored hand, or a thwart, which means crosswise, over the head. This is the only description of the guard called Krone that we have. Comes from Hans Seden Faden through Hans Madel, and guess what? It matches all the artwork that we have, and not the interpretation that everyone in this community seems to use. The Crown per Hans Seidenfaden is just a hanging parry. Or the half sword hanging parry, which is shown here. Everyone I think is familiar with Lichtenauer's four wards, right? Ox, Blug, Vom Tag, Alber. Interestingly, Hans Madel refers to Vom Tag as being Spreckfenster, which is this guard on the left here. It's hard to imagine that as from Tag. However, Peter Falkner spread on the right, maybe a little bit closer, <clears throat> and matches this illustration from the Clooney Fetch book of from Tag with the point forward, which is an interesting position. Um, and so we end up with our four wards. Except obviously all the other names are wrong. Hans Madel labels Oops, I skipped the slide. Okay, there we go. Hans Madel's upper hanger is Alber. His lower hanger is Ox. His low guard is Flug. And obviously he has a point forward from Tag. Weird, right? Except if we go to 3227A, they give almost the same guards. Everyone's always scratched their head and said, why do they call the low guard Plow and the low hanger Alber? Hans Madel does the same thing except then he also flips his ox and alber, which suggests that it's not just his weird teachings, but there was an alternative tradition of Lichtenauer's teachings that assigns different, that, that rearranges the guard names. <coughs> and if we look at this manuscript, where these pictures come from, which is from the 1490s, it actually includes both names. I know you can't read it. It's actually hard to read in the scans at all, the resolution we have. But it says, in each case, this is Ox or Alber. This is Alber or also called Flug, and so on. There's a coherent sort of network of manuscripts that all use these similar guard names, suggesting that the, the tradition may not have been as homogenous as we often like to pretend it is.
The only two guys who we have teachings from and their names are Ringek and Seidenfaden, and, or Ringek and Madel slash Seidenfaden, and they're teaching different things. That is how martial arts traditions tend to work, from what I've read in history. Once the master dies, the masters he leaves behind can teach whatever they want to. <clears throat> so I've got a few more things here. The important thing, he doubles down on his naming of the guards and explains how the fear for Zetsin, right? The four, um, four, four fendings or the four parries or whatever you want to call them, oppositions, break his new names for the guards in the traditional way. Often his teachings sort of go off the wall. His shield how begins the way other people's do, but then gets a lot more variations and a lot more if-then statements going off of it. He has this great habit of explaining things twice. He will say, this is the technique. Here's the typical open abgenomen. And then he'll give his own interpretation, which is different. As Master Hans Madel lays out and betters, and then gives a whole different interpretation of the Oban Abgenomen. The double failure, he says, according to Hans. And note, most statements in this book are according to Hans, and it doesn't say if it's Hans Madel or Hans Seidenfaden. Sometimes, like in this one, he'll say Hans Madel. Other times, he'll say Hans Seidenfaden. Mostly, he just says Hans. <clears throat> and he gives you Hans' double failure, and then he'll say, Others differ, and this is also called the double failure. And then give you a quote, word for word, from one of the other glosses, which apparently he had in front of him while he was writing this. And then say the technique that we are all familiar with. So it's not that he was just teaching something made up or that he didn't understand other people's teachings. He was intimately familiar with them and just disagreed. And ultimately, that is a master's prerogative. I mean, we look for Lichtenauer's own truth, but fencing masters in period said, I'm a master, I know how to fence, and I will teach it. And they didn't need Lichtenauer's authority for their teachings. <clears throat> and, this, and nothing illustrates that better act to me than Hans Madel himself. I apparently never actually wrote a conclusion slide for this, but the reason why I bang on the Hans Madel drum so much is because I think we've reached a place in our understanding of KDF where we can start, uh, we can get less attached to orthodoxy and start looking broader and try to understand more about Lichtenauer's art and less about Ringek's art necessarily. I mean, there are a lot of interpretations of certain glosses that are all very solid, but trying to get to the core of what they're teaching requires looking at a more of a variety of, of, uh, of glosses, a, more, a wider variety of interpretations, historical interpretations, and comparing and contrasting things like Hans Madel, where they vehemently disagree with the texts we're familiar with, can give us a better idea of what the underlying principle actually is. So I think it's a hugely important text. And I think that understanding and accepting a second line of transmission from Lichtenauer that is completely distinct from Ringek Danzig is an important um, step in our understanding of the tradition that we study. So for, for further reading, there's really not much in English. There are a lot of German texts. Sidney Anglo's book is still the standard work on, in English on the Lichtenauer tradition. It's not great. It's very old, but it's what we have. Someday someone will write a better one. Hopefully, hopefully it's not me. There's also the Lichtenauer Lichtenauer book, which has a compilation of three of, this, of the five glosses we covered, which is the anonymous gloss, the Ringek gloss, and 3227A. And it's currently available as a PDF for free download online. There'll also be a new edition, hopefully coming out in the next year or two, which has all five glosses. You know, stay tuned. All right, what are your questions? Yeah. Uh, Peter von Danzig, who didn't do unarmored longsword. So there are five glosses that cover unarmored longsword. There are three glosses that cover armored longsword, and there are two and a half glosses that cover mounted. <clears throat>
Um, but this book that we're working on now is only going to be the unarmored longsword. <clears throat> and then maybe someday a volume two that'll have other stuff. The Kuchner is his own deal. Uh, yes, over there. Uh, as a novice, I never understood why it's pseudo fear of iron. Like, what was the evidence? Well, I'm pretty sure that I explained that while you ran away. But uh, so essentially, once upon a time, it was, and it was either Hans Peter Hills or it was Martin Virchin, right, which would be the 80s or the 60s. Somebody looked at the, at the Rome Codex, which we call Codex Danzig, and saw that the very last text in it is by a dude named Peter von Danzig, and decided that the entire book was written by Peter von Danzig. But the book is an anthology of lots of things with their own authors on each section. And the gloss itself is anonymous, the one that we talk about. So pseudo Peter von Danzig just means a dude that we used to think was Peter von Danzig, and now we're 100% sure isn't. Okay. But we don't actually know who the author is. It, we al it's also sometimes called the anonymous gloss, but there are so many anonymous texts that doesn't actually tell you very much. So same thing with pseudo um, Hans Dobringer, who was, uh, who was for a while thought to be the author of 3227A. But actually, Dobringer himself wrote something else and not that. So, I mean, as Jeffrey Forgang uh, commented once, if there's one per like the, the one person in the world who we can be most sure didn't write that book is Hans Dobringer. And we know that because he forgot his name and had to add it later in the, in the margin. So, um, yeah, so there, there are certain things that are like old Hema memes that we're stuck with, even though we know they're wrong. And we try to label them that way so we know that, that we're acknowledging that it's not correct, but we still all know what we mean. Yeah. So what in this alternative guard tradition, metal is still applying the same teachings? Like they'll teach you how to break <coughs> like this ox with shadow pound? Not always. Okay. Um, with the with the Ferzetzin I mean, this Yeah, with the Ferzetzin, he he does a lot of that. I'm not I don't think he actually hits all the bases there, but he, he has a lot of interesting ideas about guard breaking. Like he also says that the Tverhau is the best cut because it can break three different guards. And he sort of really expands upon that whole concept. Um, and the Krumpau can break like three guards and he, he tries to go through and give you all the different variations. <clears throat> but it's very clear from his text that he doesn't think this is a mistake and this is how the art works to him. And it's probably how the art that he received from his teacher worked. Like, not something he made up himself. Other questions? You again? You again. I gave other people a chance. Uh, so, Mano is, is the 1490s? So, the text that we have comes from 1539. Sorry. It seems to have been written by one of his students and not by himself. No, I don't, know. I don't know anything about that. But I mean, he was teaching, he was recorded as a fencing master from 1501. So, you know, that's a period of 40 years when he seems to have been teaching. A lot of fencing masters wrote their texts at the end of their lives. Like Salvatore Fabris was in the 60s. Joachim Meyer was a young man, 34, but he also died right after, so it was still the end of his life. <laughs> um, a lot of the masters who we have biographical information for were quite old when they finally recorded their teachings. But as far as how long their careers were in this period, not a lot of data that I've seen. Other questions? All right, I think we're done then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.